welcome to you uh, to this edition of Good Evening Ghana. It's always a pleasure, an amazing pleasure to bring the show to you tonight. As always, we have so much to share with you. We're going to start our show tonight looking at the big winners of uh, the MPP Congress, and we're going to end that roll call with uh, Bantama Sensubuachi for a certain reason. And then we'll link into the Sensubuachi story because tonight we have occasion to discuss all of those matters about redevelopment and all that. Not to discuss it in detail, but just to make a point about it. And uh, so that's, that's our starting points tonight. We do have the latest on the SML contract, and it's not, it's not very palatable news because sometimes you don't understand uh, why there's such so much dishonesty in, in the system. We'll get onto the touch screen about the SML contract. The latest is that President Akufuado is waiting uh, for KPMG, Pidmawik, the uh, uh, accounting firm, to advise on the processes that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that the GRA undertook to obtain the SML contract. But tonight we are getting details about uh, some people who are involved in the anti-SML arrangement. We're going to mention names and show you their photographs. That's coming up uh, soon. And then we have uh, the Office of the Special Prosecutor. I've heard him say today in the uh, post-CDD conference, something like that, I heard him say that uh, we shouldn't scrap the Office of the Post Special Prosecutor and that there's advocacy uh, towards that, some, something like that. We, we are not advocating towards the scrapping of the Office of the Special Prosecutor, no. We are advocating towards the abrupting of the attitude of Kisi Ajabe, not even he himself. His very horrendous attitude that he brings to the Office of the Special Prosecutor, his immaturity, Kisi Ajabe's immaturity is what we are complaining about. We are not complaining about the institution and the establishment of the Office of the Special Prosecutor. No, we are complaining about Kisi Ajabe's ineptitude and immaturity. That's what we are talking about, debauchery. That's what we are complaining about. That's what we mean. And his passion for cameras. We are going to deal with that today. So he should, he should relax. We are not asking for the, for the re reconstruction or the deconstruction of the office, the establishment of the office of the special prosecutor. That's not our concern. That's a good office. It's anti-corruption. And we all like that corruption is, is a shoot from our society, isn't it? Yes, correct. But we are talking about a certain attitude of a particular special prosecutor. And we're going to ex exemplify that by telling you the narration or by narrating to you what happened in the, uh, in the court case. What happened in the court case where he showed up in court to now create substance for the conduct that he has undertaken against Cicely Adapa. The conduct that he has pursued against Cicely Adapa. It was his day in court to now put substance to it. All the theatricals came to an end in the court when they said, okay, once you get into the courtroom and shut the door, practicals are over. You leave that outside for we, the journalists. Now come into the courtroom and substantiate the things that you've been doing. And he completely disgraced himself. I'll be telling you about that also. And then uh, we are hearing disturbing news from the sub-region here in ECOWAS about um, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. All of them uh, uh, attempting to or evincing an interest to exit uh, ECOWAS the Economic Community of West African States. And so that's a, that, that's a matter that concerns us. al Hassan Bello, your favorite presenter on international politics, will return for the first time in 2024 to the touch screen tonight to tell us what it is. Okay, Kweku, our, our producer lawyer, is also preparing to explain to us what happened in the Adam Mahama uh, verdict. It was, it was very, it was very uh, difficult, very painful, it, as you sort of recollected the kinds of uh, gruesome, the gruesome pictures of the gruesome murder, the unwarranted murder of Major Mahama, that, that was shocking, wasn't it? And uh, so when you saw the trial and you saw his mother speaking and you saw the image of his wife, it was very, very sad. Um, uh, Apriku will get to the touch screen and explain to us what we are finding tonight. We still are keeping an eye on the American election and uh, we'll, we'll tell you the latest in terms of the dates of what's going to happen. We are planning a big coverage of that election as well this year. All of this. Uh, uh, coming to you tonight. It's 24 minutes past the top of the hour, 9 o'clock. Uh, I have an unpleasant uh, position now to take the first break. My bosses are very upset with me. They say that when I start the program and we get into the flight, we never take the commercial break. So uh, I I'm sorry, viewers. I have to take five minutes of commercial break. When we come back, the spirit will have descended on us. I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, we are back on air. Thank you very much for your patience and for the break. We now have to serve you our regular menu 
of current affairs, political analysis, narratives, opinions, etc., etc., news, stories, narratives, education, everything. I just got a copy of this book, and please get a copy of the book if you want. Uh, in the Eye of the Storm is the autobiography of Mr. Justice Francis Emil Short. It's completely amazing. It's completely amazing. Emil Short, thank you very much for putting this in the book. Ah, wow. Uh, we have been researching into it and using it to do our stuff. Uh, um, it's entitled In the Eye of the Storm. It wasn't just a short in the eye of the storm. It certainly was. Just as Emil Short has put, put up a book. I always applaud public people who write a book. Emil Short, congratulations. Thank you very much for that. He talks about everything that happened. Those of you of my generation, remember the PV of being trial and Kenalo Seusu and all of that. He, he discusses everything. His meetings with Flight Left and Rollers. He discusses them. Get a copy of the book and pay more money for it. It's by Justice Emil Short. Uh, Mr. Justice Emil Short. I got a copy in Kumasi uh, where I was at the weekend. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with the big winners of the MPP event. And we're going to end uh, with that Sensu story. We'll talk about SML contracts, what we know about it uh, up until now. And, um, and uh, please t tell my, my producer to get me Senor Jose's photograph. Senor Jose, my friend Senor Jose, I need his photograph for the uh, SML analysis. So if, if he's not watching, tell him that his name has been mentioned. And uh, we're going to put his photograph and then talk about SML. Uh, my friend Senor Jose, he's a, he's a very vibrant, uh, exuberant, and very intelligent young man. Okay, uh, good evening again, and welcome to the show. All right, so after that, we'll, we'll deal with the Kisira Dabe matter. I'm just looking on my desk to see if there's anything left, and then I head straight for the touch screen to mount it. I think I have, uh, I'm ready now to do that. Uh, okay. Excelento. Ah, as for my money, I think I agree with the first photograph uh, on, on the screen, and it's about Gabriel, uh, uh, Aaron Michael Quay, uh, Gabo, and um, very, very delighted to stand here on this occasion uh, when I was looking at Gabo back in the day in, in Clark House now. He has promised me an interview. He says maybe he'll come on Thursday, maybe he'll come next week. But whenever he comes, I'll bring up these stories uh, from Presec. I was in Engman. He was in Clark. So it's just a walking distance from the two houses, house two for Clark and three for Engman. And he had a good friend called Laddles. And uh, when he comes here, I ask him about Laddles. Laddles is also doing very well in public office these days. I don't want to mention where he is, but Laddles and Gabo were very, very good friends, and I, I still remember that. Uh, I mean, he served the party so well, and I, I, I will say this, when the election of 2008, the first round election was lost, and this is a story that you may have heard Mr. Kwabene Japon say, I, was, I wanted to be the first to get an interview from the candidate who won the uh, vote but did not win the election, so I went to uh, candidate Akufado's home very early in the morning. He was staying at East Ligon at the time. When I went there, Michael Okwe was there. And Michael Kuo and I were both there when Kwabene Japan walked in, just before 6 o'clock around that time. Uh, the candidate had just woken up, and uh, the results had been declared. The election was in the second round. Uh, we were there from 6 o'clock to about 7 or something, just before 7. And within a matter of one hour or so, the people who masked up in the house, they were counting over 500 people within that very short time. And then, then, then we exited, and the candidate has his meeting with his political people. So this is Michael Kuo's dedication to the MPP course. I'm talking about 2008. I'm not talking about 2016 or 2012, 2008, way back there. This is uh, Michael Quay's dedication uh, to the issue. When you give me this photograph without the NDC flag, somebody says that I've put MPP flag behind me. So <laughs> please, <laughs> cameraman, come and open it up and let them know that there's NDC flag here, there's MPP flag here. Yes, please. This is always better. You can, you can frame in and frame out and frame in and frame out, yes. But when you, when you frame in and it's just this one, then there's a problem, you know. We're a very radical political show. I mean, not many political shows have displaying flags of the leading political parties ahead of the election in your studio. But when you do that, you also sometimes come to these difficulties where a shot is taken from one angle because here we deploy about 23 shots uh, for this show all the time. We deploy all that all the time. So angles are coming from different places and some of the angles may not have both flags and People have been sending me texts, etc., etc. I've been explaining anyway. Congratulations, Michael Quay. We expect that uh, coming from such a rich political tradition, a rich culture from his own home. His father is a former speaker. His father for many years had been an educator, raising young people like all of us through the universities and through pre -second. In the universities, he taught uh, students political science. He became the head of the political science department. Michael Quay has worked so hard for this party. And it is a delight to see that uh, as Michael Quay is growing, Michael Kwe is also coming. Congratulations, Gabo. I think that he was one of the biggest winners uh, of last Saturday's event. This is um, 
uh, our member of parliament, the, the police police officer, is a member of parliament in Mankesim. You remember her? She's a widow. Her husband died uh, the other day. She represented her husband. And I was surprised when I heard that people were challenging her for the primaries. I was quite surprised. Uh, but uh, the, the, the central region guru, uh, my minister, Koko Furesiyama, assured me that uh, she was going to win. I'll tell you another story about Koko Furesiyama in Kumasi last Saturday about this event. But she assured me that she was going to win, and I was hoping that she would. She's also one of the very big winners of Saturday, and uh, it's expected that in Fantiman. Whoa, 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 whoa. Please, can you get me the Black Stars tape? Because I, I like to speak about, I call him, you know, I have a very personal relationship with him, so I don't call him Katie Hammond. I call him Honorable Tahiru. Now, the, 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 the T in his name, the KT, the T is Tahiru. So it's Kobena Tahiru Hammond from Adisadal College. So I call him Tahiru. He, you see, he has longevity in many things. In, I think in this Fourth Republic, he's the longest serving deputy minister. He served for deputy minister for eight years, same portfolio. I don't know whether he's longer than Obiyamwa. Obiyamwa is longer than him. But he was the uh, deputy minister for energy throughout the Kufour period, where Kufour's, in, in Kufour's period, the energy ministry changed frequently. I think he had Michael Kwe had been there. There was uh, Papa Kwesi Indum had been there. Albert Kandapa had been there. And Kofiada had been there. So that makes it four ministers during the period of uh, the President J. Kofour at the Ministry of Energy. Guess who was the deputy minister throughout from beginning to end? Tahiru is my man, you know. Let's listen to him. See, if you haven't prepared any meal before you watch the match, I implore you, you should have your meal before you watch this match. Blasters. Uh, that's what I complained about some time back during Kufo's administration. When we had the can here in Accra, and as a went and reported me to the president that I was criticizing them. We sit down there in the studio with all our hearts, and they are falling down all over, and they are not scoring. <laughs> Well, if one goal would skip us through, please, let's play for one goal. The man was talking about three goals. What do you need three goals for? <laughs> the blasters. The blasters. Well, are they playing this evening or I've actually lost, lost track of them? But, Your Excellency, if you haven't prepared any meal before you watch the match, I implore you, you should have your meal before you watch this match. Blasters. That's what I complained about some time back during Kufo's administration. When we had a can here in Accra, and as a went and reported me to the president that I was criticizing them. We sit down there in the studio with all our hearts, and they are falling down all over, and they are not scoring. <laughs> well, if one goal would we'll describe us through, please, let's play for one goal. The man was talking about three goals. What do you need three goals for? What do, we, what do we need three goals for? The Bafana, Bafana leading 1-0. So that's Katie Hammond. Uh, what you see is what you get. I like him for that. It's straightforward. He'll tell you what it is. So just move on and say it directly. And uh, it, it, you have to give him something. He's now won at Asokwa, I believe, for the sixth time, something like that. He came to Parliament uh, from the United Kingdom. Those days, he was a practicing barrister there. He was with Elizabeth Ohini and, uh, and all of them. They used to call themselves the Ghana generation. When I did a story in, in London in 2001, about the Ghanaians exiled. So my story was about the Ghanaians who have been exiled, uh, working in England. Now that the Rawlings is no more, were they going to come back? And uh, Elizabeth O'Hini was already in as Minister for Media Relations, coming from the BBC. And they were all sort of getting back. Katie Hammond was a big part of that project, the project of those who came in after J.J. Rawlings was no more. And they called themselves the Ghana generation. Uh, Nidodu, lawyer Nidodu is, uh, is also, Nibedu, lawyer, lawyer Nibedu is also one of them. Lawyer Nibedu is a board member of the uh, Public Procurement Authority. He was one of those people in the Ghana generation that I interviewed in 2001. How many years ago is that? 23 years. That's when I met uh, Tahiru and he came to report me to Dan Boche, who was at the time the General Secretary of the party. He came back to Ghana. One day I said, Dan Boche called me, he said, come to my office. I went there, I saw, he said, do you know this man? I said, yeah, I think I saw him in London. He said, well, oh, 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 I'll be a question anyhow. I said, hey, who is this? <laughs> and I was looking at him and said, oh, okay. He said, okay, Tiamon, he's going to be MP as Adan Sokwa. Then I asked Ambochi, but does he have a Ghanaian passport? He said, hey, 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 look, out. you're asking all these funny questions. This was a conversation in 2000, before 2001, in 2000, before he filed his nomination then. And Katie Amon has been through uh, up until now. I was delighted that he won, but I have to say that I was surprised. 
I was thinking that Katie Amon should drop this thing before these guys go and embarrass him and lose. I was very worried. I was asking everyone that what is happening, what is happening. They said, I didn't know about Katie Amon's place. So I was, I was very worried and I was thinking he was not going to win. But then the results came and then it surprised me and everyone. Tahiru, I salute you and the Black Stars will score more than one goal. So don't worry about it. Another big winner from Saturday is Katie Hammond. Yes. Now, this is the story. This is the story. Now, the viewers, you have to, you have to listen to this story because... Usikeni Eboa here is my man. Usikeni Eboa is the guy on the... So he's a, a, a barrister at law. He's a, a land specialist, land law specialist. He has, his CV is particularly impressive. He has an MBA. He has many things. But I'll tell you something. And I don't have his permission to say it, but I'll tell you. Usikeni Eboa is responsible for uh, Prophet Bushiri, who came here to speak in 2016 or so. I didn't know that. I met him and he was telling me that, that he's, he's my... Very, very, very good friend. We go back, way, way back in Legon when he ran for SRC. I gave him that name, Osikene Eboa. His actual name is uh, lawyer Obri Eboa. His name is Obri Eboa. But I call him Osikene Eboa because when we were in school, he was very wealthy, you know. I come from Kumase and uh, we were in Commonwealth all together and we're fraternizing as we always do. And uh, he explained that he wanted to run for GCR president. And, you know, normally when you say that, the boys sort of check you out. So I, I, they came to see me. We were gossiping when he wasn't there about, uh, ah, Yeboah says he wants to run for, and I told him that Charlie Yeboah, he has money. And uh, I, can, I don't want to mention their names because they are all important people in corporate these days. And then one of them told me that you should have said Charlie, the guy has money, brutal. You know, come on, what we like people who have money. Yeah, come on, boys, we like people who have money. So, so they said, okay, let's go and see him. So we went to his room and said, we understand that you are running for JCR president, so we want to help you. He was very enthusiastic about it. We worked together uh, for his campaign. And then uh, on the day of the face-to-face -face in Commonwealth, he said he wanted to arrive at the place with loud music. That had not happened before. You know, face-to-face -face in Commonwealth, you arrive with Ashin Jamai. And then he said he wants to arrive with loud music. So we set up a stereo system. I was carrying one of the speakers. Uh, uh, Pore was carrying, I won't tell you who Pore is because a high-profile person. So Pore was carrying one of the speakers. We played Lumbe songs and then we descended into the place. It was a fantastic night. That's how I know him. That's how well I know Obriya Boy. So he's really my man. I didn't know he was running for Subin. I didn't know. Last week, Monday, was it last? Just a week before the, I had not checked. But I know that he had had a connection with Subin since 2000s. Those days, he used to have a travel agency. When you are going to Kumase, or when you get into Kumase from KNUST, that long road that goes all the way to the Cocoa Board, when you get to the uh, Asafu area, on the right-hand side, he has a travel agency there. So we always stop there and shout his name or something like that when we are in Kumase and he'll come out. Those days, we are on vacation. And he, and he, he, was, he has a, a very thriving travel, travel agency then in those days. That's why we call him Osike But He's been an entrepreneur forever. When he was a student, he was an entrepreneur. So Osike Nyeboa called me about a week ago or so, just 10 days later. So I, I saw the call. I picked. I said, Osike Nyeboa, hey, Paulus, now we'll make a contest known to you. I said, which contest? He said, I'm going to be. I said, hey, are you sure? He said, ah, am I sure? I said, that's my final nomination. He was laughing at me. I said, ah, so what do we need to do? They say, Bermiska, Bermiska, Paulus, Bermiska. I said, I'm a miniscal. He said, Copel, I'm calling down for four normal words. Can it be for Zoom line on me? Yes, can me? Yes, can me? Buta. I said, you, Jimmy, you not to her. I said, are you sure? He said, oh, Paulus. Ah. I said, Osikeni, he said, oh, Paulus. Ah. You, Jimmy, you not sure. But I had known that Osikeni had been, had a relationship with Subin since SK Boafo's days. So let's see, let's see what I have here. Aha. Uh -huh. This is Eugene. I'm going to tell you another concern story. If you were we are we are building it up slowly. I, I don't want to. It's a Tuesday. We are all getting tired. We've come home, so I want to build it up slowly before I get to the brutal issues. This is uh, Eugene Enchi, my friend, uh, and Andy Apiakubi. The day after I spoke to Sikeni, I went out in the afternoon to have lunch. I, I don't often do that, but I went to have lunch somewhere in Accra. Then, in the place where I was having lunch, just as I was about to finish, I saw the two of them walk in. Eugene came in first, and Apia could be followed. And they hadn't seen me, but I had seen them. So I, I told my, my, my colleague, I was one of the, the guys, I told him that, look, look at them. They are going to plot against Akufado. I've caught them. And then we all laughed. So when I finished, I went to their table. The, the both of them were there. And I had my phone in my hand like that. So Apia Kubi saw me first. Of course, I've known Apia Kubi from Legon. He was an SRC president. That's a very long time ago. He was SRC president before 2000, a very long time ago. So I was holding my phone like this, and then I, I went into their company. And I dropped my phone, and I said, mu, mu, mu di so I'm recording it. I'll go and play it for him. Then they all laughed. And Andy said, yeah, di And Eugene said, auntie, I can't answer my And I said, ah, but Eugene, 
Uh, Obi Eboa is challenging you. He said, yeah, I know. Do you know him? I said, he's my man. Pa, 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 pa. And I said, but what's going to happen? He said, well, he doesn't think that Obi Eboa stands a chance. He thinks he's going to win. Frankly, if I have to tell you the truth, viewers, I, I believed you, Jen. I, I, I was struggling to see how my friend Obi Eboa is going to win this thing. And I mean, I, and I thought to myself, that, hey, if Eugene doesn't win this thing, he's in trouble. Oh, this uh, euphoria tactics, or if Eugene doesn't win this thing, he's in trouble. I was telling myself. So I shook hands with them. We spoke, and I, I asked Apia Kubi whether he's okay. He said that, yeah, he's struggling, but he thinks that he will eventually make it. I congratulated both of them, wished them well. I told them I'll be in Kumase for the, for the Saturday event. So maybe I'll see them. All right. Then I left. So then I arrived in Kumase. Uh, um, uh, on Saturday, was it Saturday? I went to, I think it was Friday. Oh, was it Saturday? Friday, Friday. I arrived in Kumasi on Friday night. When uh, the team arrived at, later than me, but I arrived a bit early, on Friday night. In, the, in my company at the Kumasi airport was Peter McMenu, the, the famous party chairman of MPP. Now, Peter McMenu had been met by his uh, MPP people. Rita Sobayer was there, and some key people had come to see him at the airport. So I was eavesdropping on their conversation. So I had Peter McMenu asking questions. What's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? And the, the atmosphere at that place was somebody comes and asks, are we winning? And they ask which constituency because, you know, the constituencies were many. So as I eased up on the conversation, I heard one of them, McMenu, asking him that how is to be. And the guy said it's 50-50. So I became interested. So I, I spoke across to them. And I said, Uncle Peter, ah, the, so being also 50-50. And he said, yes, I'm okay. And I said, hey, Chief. Are you sure so we see people say, yeah, so I had you. I had him means for who, you know, that, that kind of conversation, you really can't disclose who you support. So when he said I had you, you can't ask I had for who, and then, then he has to spill the beans. So he won't say it. So he just said, so I had him, fam. And I said, ah, well, how did this happen? How did Obi Ebua be able to make Subi so I had on Friday night, few hours to the voting? I thought that was quite impressive. So when the guy left, I asked Mark Menuda, but is this somebody that you can rely on? Uh, uh, I'll come to this. Uh, which photographs are these? I'm looking for Isaac Osei and SK Boafo. That's, that's wrong, please. SK Boafo is an old man. SK Boafo, the first MP for Subi. That's not him. Uh, SK Boafo is an old man. SK Samson Kweku Boafo, member of parliament for Subi in constituency. It was 2000, 2004, and I believe Isaac Osei came in 2009 after eight going forward. Okay, so uh, the guy told McMenu that the thing, so I went back to McMenu and asked him that, Uncle Mark, what, what does the guy say? He said, eh, that's what he's saying about Subi. And Mark said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm coming to cover it and observe it and all that. He said, but uh, where's your minister? I said, he's in Kumasi. He said, eh, what's he doing in Kumasi? Tell him to come and see me. I said, okay, I'll tell him. And then et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's how Subi ended. But this is the Subi situation. Uh, Eugene, uh, perhaps let me start with Obi Eboa. Yes, Obi Eboa here was nurturing his ambition for Subin after SK Boafo. SK Boafo left in 2008, I believe. SK Boafo was 96 to 2000, 2000 to 2004, 2004, 2008. At the time SK Boafo was MP, there were speculations about who is going to replace him. And many thought that his son, Yao Boafo, who is today the president of the Ghana Bar Association, might be interested because uh, I was working as Asante Kotoko at the time. Yao Boafo was Asante Kotoko lawyer. I was quite established in Kumasi as a young man. And being a Kotoko lawyer made him very famous and quite popular. So if he wanted to run for parliamentary seat, it wasn't going to be that difficult. So people were speculating that after uh, Samson Kukubwa for his son, uh, Yabuafu will become the, uh, the Subin guy. But Obri Yabua was there. In those days, Obri Yabua was there. He, was, he had begun to nurture the constituency. What happened to Obri Yabua is that because he was such a fierce Kufour loyalist, he was such a fierce Kufour loyalist, and, uh, and President Kufour brought uh, Isaac Osei, uh, I'll cancel this one. This, this, this is not uh, Skebuafu. President Kufour brought Isaac Osei to be the MP when Isaac Osei was taken from the High Commission to lead Cocoa Board. Because Isaac Osei was coming from President Kufour, it was very difficult for uh, uh, Obri Bohane to, to compete. So he gave his very loyal support to Isaac Osei, believing that after Isaac Osei would be him. That, that's, so Obri Abwa has been, for, for those who are surprised, like I was with the figures, but this is really the history of Subin, as far as I know, based on my relationship with Uskeni Eboa, who has now been elected. So he, he, he was such a brutal Kofor lawyer as an LSC. He would be with Richard Anani. He was with Kojo Pieni. I mean, he was in, he was in Kumasi doing, doing what has to be done for the MPP back, back, back in those days. 
So he, he had a lot of respect for Isaac Osei, complete, total respect for Isaac Osei. Everyone does, does it? don't we all? So uh, he couldn't contest. Then the Isaac Osei situation became uncomfortable when after Kufo and Akufado became the leader of the party. And people around Akufado at the time were particularly supportive of Eugene Entry. That, that's what happened. Most of the people around Akufado at that time, you can name them, Dana Santi Bedier, to everybody. All those people were particularly supportive of Eugene Entry. So after Isaac Osei had defeated Eugene Entry in one of the contests, I believe it was 2012 or so, uh, it, people felt after Isaac Osei had announced that he was no longer interested in the seat. That's what happened. Isaac Osei had announced that he was no longer interested in the Subin seats. And so, you know, Eugene can have it, sort of. Eugene had then started mobilizing his situation. Mind you, Obri Eboa is now, you know, is, is now gone onto the other path. Obri Eboa is, is gone away because... From Isaac Osei, the thing is going to Eugene. Yes, thank you very much. That is, that is uh, uh, S.K. Boafo. Yes, Samson Kweku Boafo. Uh, one, of, one of the good fathers I've had in this uh, career of journalism. He's always been very interested in my work back in the day. And I'll go to Kumasi and I'll stay in his house. And I'll go to his house. I don't stay there, but I'll go to his house. And he'll show me around. We'll go to the stadium together. Very, very, very nice man. I, I, sometimes I go to London and I call him. He's there. I go and see. He's, he has a church in London called Edmonton Temple. Huge one. Very, very successful church, uh, S.K. Boafo's church. So S.K. Boafo was the MP. Then comes Isaac Osei. And then after Isaac Osei comes uh, uh, Eugene Entry. That's Senor Jose. I'll come to him. Let me have Eugene Entry and uh, Eugene Entry back. Uh, so Eugene Entry comes in in that manner. Okay. Thank you. This is Eugene. What then happens with Eugene Entry is that after power is won in 2016, uh, Akufado becomes president. He becomes a member of parliament. Something went wrong somewhere. Eugene Entry appears to have fallen out, or they have fallen out with him. Some of the key people around President Akufado are no longer excited about Eugene. For, for some reason, I don't know. I've not checked. I've not asked because in, in politics, these things happen. We are on the sidelines covering it. So it's not everything you see that you ask, but you try and understand what you are seeing. What was clear and obvious is that Eugene Entry had fallen out with the key decision makers around President Akufado. I'm not sure for what, but he had been made deputy minister for works and housing in the 2017 uh, list of ministers, appointed under Article 79. And um, Eugene had not been repeated, even though he had won his seat. So that made it very obvious for any observer that there was a problem between Eugene Entry, whether philosophy, culture, I don't know, and some of the key decision makers in the government. There was a clear problem there. Because Eugene had won his seat in Subin, but he had not been repeated as a minister. So, and both he and Atachia had been chucked out of the Ministry of Works and Housing, replaced by different people. So it appeared that, yes. And then came the, uh, the, the, the attempted coup d'etat against Ken Oforiata, and you saw that Eugene was leading it. So it was very obvious by then, even to a Kesri observer, that there was a problem between Eugene Entry and the key decision makers around President Akufado. That was very, very clear. Here was Eugene Entry leading a charge against Ken Oforiata, and it surprised me very much, because the first time I met Eugene, in Laboni, when he was introduced to me as a Ghanaian abroad who is coming to parliament, it was in the house of Ken Oforiata and the company of Ken Oforiata. So I remember that. So when I saw Eugene, given all the circumstances, there was clearly a problem with this situation. Okay, back to Isaac Osei. Let me, let me show. Let me, let me show. Now, Isaac Osei, you would have noticed, may also have had some difficulty with Jubilee during the time that he was at Tor as Temaho Refinery Chief Executive. We know the circumstances of it. But it is quite obvious that whatever difficulty there was between Jubilee and Isaac Osei had been completely and beautifully repaired by the time 2021 came. For that reason, you will see that Isaac Osei had been appointed by President Akufado as chairman of Gapoha, one of the most important establishments, revenue agencies for the government. And you know, Isaac also has an economist background. Really, that's what he is. He's a trade economist. That's what Isaac Osei is. So putting him in Gapoha sort of connected with with the fact that he, he was needed, and also, very importantly, that he was in the back in the good books of the, back in the good books of the Jubilee House people. Okay. Meanwhile, Eugene Entry's relationship is deteriorating. Isaac Osei's relationship is building up. Eugene Entry also appeared not to have cleaned up his exits and detachments from Isaac Osei when he inherited the seat. That's the problem. That's one main problem. Eugene appeared not to have tidied up his inheritance of Isaac Osei's seat in Subin. That, that, that happened. That, that's obvious. And some people I know told me that, Unim Eugene, I'm say, you should go and make peace with Isaac Osei. 
And I asked her, why is Eugene having war with Isaac Osei? They said, no, they're not having war, but Eugene is younger. He should go and make peace with Isaac Osei. I've heard that a few people say that. I don't know the details. So now, this is Eugene's conundrum. He's inherited a seat from Isaac Osei, who took it nicely and beautifully from S.K. Boafo. And S.K. Boafo was happy to hand over Subin to Isaac Osei. That, that, that happened. Now, Eugene comes in on the strength of the Akufado revolution of the MPP in 2013, 14, 15, 16, that, that, that period when the party was revolutionized by the Akufado philosophy. That's the period that Eugene comes in, he flies in with that bandwagon and becomes member of parliament. He has not repaired his relationship with Isaac Osei. And then he falls out with the very people who bet him into the party. Eugene Entry falls out with the people who bet him, the people who introduce him to journalists and introduce him to people and got him really started politically. Those people, he's falling out with them. So he really doesn't have legs to stand on. So Isaac Osei then remembers, uh, where's my friend? Yes, Obri Yeboah. Isaac Osei remembers Obri Yeboah and thinks that, ah, if there's somebody here in Subin who has not been looked at well, I think it is Obri Yeboah, the lawyer. You should get, you should get the lawyer. Obri Yeboah is also S.K. Boafo's boy. So the godfathers of Subin, Isaac Osei, S.K. Boafo, they think Obri Yeboa. Who is going to support Eugene? The people who birth Eugene into the party, the Akufado people, they don't like Eugene anymore. So Akufado people, Obri Yeboa himself and his own people, I told you he had a travel agency, he had businesses in Subin, so his own capacity, plus the goodwill of Isaac Osei, plus the goodwill of S.K. Boafo, is what resulted in the overwhelming victory that Eugene had, That's what, uh, that Obri Yeboa had. That's why Eugene got 100 and Obri Yeboah got 700 in a race that people were not even looking at, in a race that people didn't think was going on. People thought Eugene had, I, I by the Monday before the Saturday when I met Eugene in Accra with the company of Ayapia Kubi, I was sure that Eugene was going to win. I love Obri Yeboah to bits, of course, he's my good friend, but I wasn't sure that he was going to win. I, even me, who calls myself political journalist and who is interested in these matters, I was unaware that Obi Yeboah was running until he called me days to the event, Monday to Saturday. He called me and said, Apollos, that made me call you a campaign on Bremiska. And I said, which campaign are you talking about? He said, I'm running for Subin. I actually called Rosemary and told her that Charlie, because we both know him. I told Rosemary that Oskini is running for Subin. He said, hey, no, no, Asama Abba. I said, Charlie, Asama Abba, big time. And we all laughed at off. And I called our friends and said, Charlie, Oskini is running. You know, some of them told me, I didn't know they've seen it. And you no, know, he was very popular in Commonwealth, particularly popular. So we all know him. So I didn't think, but then I, on Saturday, I began to analyze it. Now, I'll tell you another story. This is the last story. Uh, let's get back to the, let's get back, let's get back to the list of people. <laughs> I'll tell you another story. I'll tell you another story. That, that it, it makes politics very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, get back to the, yeah, the rule. Okay, so that's Matthew Opoku Prempe. He won handsomely. Uh, thank you very much. Gideon Gwakun is another guy who won really well. I, I spoke with him today. He says he's still in the village. He'll be back on Saturday, something like that. And I see many journalists have called him about it. He's done excellently well. Congratulations. So on Saturday, I, uh, Friday, I went to bed in Kumasi quite late as usual. And then uh, Saturday morning around, very early in the morning, I spoke to uh, Kuku Foyesiyama, the Minister for Transport. And I, he, he said, hey, Charlie, wake up, wake up, you bed, wake up. I said, what's happening? He said, Anati, wake up. I mean, now we finish the operation, you know. I said, which operation? He said, oh, we finish, we finish. I said, so what's going to happen? He said, so, okay, that was my first quest. I said, so, okay. He said, so, he's going to win. Voting hadn't started, you know. And I'm explaining to you how these are politicians work into these things, work into the night and understand what is happening. It's not simple at all. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated matter. Now, he was telling me early in the morning before voting started that I shouldn't worry. I said, so, we'll be okay. And I said, ah, but how do you know he will laugh at me? I said, what about how Akumsin? He said, oh, Akumsin will be fine. Oh, I'll go win big. You go win big. Voting hadn't started. He was just telling me. Then I said, Eugene, he said, oh, Eugene go lose. I said, are you serious? He said, oh, Eugene go lose this morning. I said, but the voting will start at 7. Said, I'm telling you, Jack, he was laughing at me. Oh, Eugene, Eugene go lose, Eugene go lose. He predicted almost everything that happened in, in, the, in the situation in Ashanti region especially. And then how it comes in place. He predicted. Then I asked him, what about Abna? He said, Abna, Abna go win. I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah, Abna go win. I'm referring to the Deputy Minister of uh, Finance who won a very handsome uh, victory at uh, Etiwa in the Eastern region. So this is the conversation we had on Saturday. I, I slept again. He said he was going to look, hang around until about midday and then he'll sleep. I said about midday. He said the voting went around 2 o'clock, so by 4 they finished counting. But as far as he's concerned, the work is over. They've done what they have to do. 
and uh, they've spoken to everybody they have to speak to and he thinks that these are the outcomes that are going to happen based on the work that the candidates had done you know so <laughs> that that was also very interesting Gideon Boako here was in a, 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 I was in a meeting with him I I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the rest of the parties much earlier months ago and in this meeting Gideon was being urged to step down for um, Frida Prempe I just happened to be there and they were talking about this so Gideon was hesitating. He said, no, he's not going to step down. He's going to focus on this thing. He's going to win. And Gideon has some data showing how the party's votes had been going down, even though the party had been winning the parliamentary seats, how the votes has been going down over a little a certain period. So when the meeting ended, I walked out with Gideon and I asked him that, but are you sure that you can win? He said, oh, Tano, I'll win, Paul, I'll win. I said, but you know, I, I, I sort of buy the argument they were making to you that you know, you're working for the boss. You know, stay there, push the agenda, let's get the boss, you know. He said, no, but I can do both. As for the boss, I've been doing it. I was a youth organizer in Ashanti region. I've been doing, I can do all of, all of it. I said, but if, if, I told you, if you are sure you're going to win, by all means go for it. But if you don't know whether you're going to win or not, then because of the image of the boss, Gideon, please, this thing, have a look at it. He said, Paul, let me tell you, this thing, I'm going to win it. I said you, I hear you. God be with you. That was two and a half months ago, something like that. So today I called him. I sent him a video, actually. I sent him a video of what's something we had done here. And then I, 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 oh, he called me. I think he received the video. He called me by WhatsApp, yeah. So I picked him. I said, hey, Charlie, congratulations. So he said, I told you I was going to win. I told you. I told you. I said, this one, you've done very well. When I come into a cry, he says he's there till Saturday or something like that. And he said that he has seen the video that I sent him. So he will look at it and then get back to me. Congratulations, Gideon. That, 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 that was really good. That was really good. Now, this, this is the one. <laughs> this is the one. Hawa Kumsin. Hawa Kumsin, eh? Look, viewers, she's brutal. After everything that was said, Hawa Kumsin got... Let me, let, me, let me write it down. Let me write it down. <laughs> Hawa Kumsin. Aha. Hawa Kumsin, eh? She's brutal. When I called her and I said that she's brutal, I'll tell you what she said. Our Kumsin is brutal. <laughs> totally brutal. When I called her and I said that, Madam, you are brutal. In, that, in the soft voice, you even think it's I said, oh, God is brutal. God is brutal. That's what she said. I said, Madam, this one, you are brutal. She said, oh, God, God is brutal. God is brutal. I think that she did very well. And for the fact that she had been challenged by men throughout the period and she keeps defeating the men, I think there's something to say for Hawa Kumsin. The, the, her competitor got 97, and she got 1,300 and something. That's why I said it is brutal. I mean, she, I think she's the biggest winner from Saturday. Ultimately, Hawa Kumsin is the biggest winner from Saturday. This was a significant victory. And of course, Emma told me that well, Hawa will win big. Win big, I thought, meant 300 different, something like that, because of what we had heard and what we had been told and then how other voting that occurred there, the presidential primaries had gone. All of us who love Hawa Kumsin were sort of on edge. What's going to happen? And I kept calling my people. Have you checked what's happening in Cape Coast, uh, in, in uh, Kaswa? I kept telling them. They said, what? I said, check, check Hawa Kumsin. What's happening? They said, we don't have it yet. Sometime around 3 o'clock, they called me and said, they've sent me Hawa Kumsin. I should look at it. And I said, did she win? They said, yeah, she won, but I should look at it. I looked at it in 97, 1,300 and something. I mean, that was good. That, that, was, uh, that, that was powerful. But um, God is brutal. <laughs> but you, you too, you are brutal small. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think, I think she, won, she won a good grace. Let me come now to... Uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I need to get it back here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, to Bantamas and Subwachi. Uh, where, where do I begin? Because I'm leading this into a conversation, a bigger conversation about the accusations against Asen and Subwachi. You know, the Kennedy Japan had run a campaign in the constituency for and on behalf of his brother and had said that Asen Subwachi, he had alleged... Corruption against Hassan Subwachi. This is a photograph that I've, 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 we took on Saturday. And I've seen people using it. And I, I, I get angry because we, they don't put a good evening Ghana there. This was a photographer who did such an excellent job. How he was able to capture the two of them standing this way in Bantama. A photographer, we, we owe him 10 CDs. We have to pay him. We have to, we have to pay him more. This, this was a very particularly good photograph. Really, really good photograph. And I don't know whether this had happened before the singing or after the singing. Kofi is there. You can tell us. Kofi was with them. So on the morning of uh, the campaign, as I told you, and I, I spoke early in the morning to Fraser, and I asked him that, uh, that's, that's the first question, and so we'll be fine. No problem. So uh, there, was, there was some significant confidence. Now, Kennedy Japan had been talking about, uh, uh, 
about Asen. So he had gone to the constituency to mount a campaign against him and had, said, had alleged corruption against him. He had alleged that he is in the business of selling government houses in his capacity as works and housing minister for private developers and pocketing the money. It was very, very unwholesome. Statements came out from Western House, etc., etc. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But then all of this fracas then culminated into a worship challenge between the two candidates on voting morning. A worship challenge. Have a look at Asensu leading the charge and how his opponent responded using the same gospel song, changing the words, one to be pro, one to be anti. This is how it happened. <laughs> All right, all right. I like the guy's song. He said, One tema na obeye. One tema na obeye. Eradia kase obeye one tem. Anyway, so this was, uh, this, this contest now became a big deal because one of the important people in the MPP had weighed into it. His brother is running. His brother here, Kennedy Japan's brother here, Honorable a nice gentleman lawyer is running and so kennedy came in and alleged that asensu had uh, taken government bungalows and sort of put them out for sale sold it okay so the story became a media story now i'm coming back onto something and i often hear people especially people abroad they call me and they ask me that charlie this is your program people are complaining about it. i said what is happening what are they complaining about See, they are complaining that you defend government too much i said but it is not true they should say what I have said, which is untrue. And I'm always at labor to sort of explain that everything I've said here is true. This issue about defending government means what? And it has been assumed that once a person is a journalist, he ought to be against government. That's okay. No problem. But you can, the fact that government has done something or government is being discussed, it doesn't mean that a journalist should always be against government, even when government is doing something right. Even when the propaganda against government is, 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 is not true. Even when the journalist story against government is untrue. And I've also been accused of, of uh, attacking other journalists. You say that Manasseh's work is crass. I've been using that word all the time. I was delighted with this, this uh, narrative developed by Samson Ladia Yenini of Joy FM of all places. Joy FM of all places, they say that they are independent media. They don't, they don't praise government. They are after government and all of that. I have not understood it. But it's a position they are entitled to take. Because I think that a journalist looks at the matter and makes a determination, same way that a judge does. And you can take your opinion one way or the other. And if journalism has conducted work, and that work is crass, we have to say it as it is. Here is something, Ladi, of Joy FM and News File, my good friend, now defending the position that Asensu took on the matter of redeployment, redevelopment against Kennedy Japan. And something, Ladi, is criticizing the work of journalists. Something they said is only Paul Adumachi who does and he shouldn't be doing it. Something they say, oh, as for Paul Adumachi every day, a minister does something, Cecilia Dapa goes to steal money and Paul Adumachi is defending him. Uh, how Akumsin cannot speak English, Paul Adumachi is defending her. Uh, uh, any minister does something, as for Akufado, if you go and say it, yeah, that one, dear Basa, Paul Adumachi will mount his touch screen and all that Paul Adumachi says is true, by the way. Nothing up till today has been proven to be untrue. We are coming to Kisar Jabe. Our fight with Islam Dapa has now ended. We have won. We are coming to show you why. Now, Samson Ladi goes on a tangent in fierce defense of Asensu's position, which I agree with. Asensu's position is correct. I said, I read a statement from the Works and Houses. He's not stealing anything. He's not stealing government bungalows. That's not what he's doing. He is ensuring, as has been a policy that he has inherited, to be sure that space is used in a certain way that is profitable to the state. 
and to the state actors who need these bungalows. Fundamentally, that's what Asensu is doing. That's what re redevelopment is about. But it was said that he was stealing. I know that he wasn't stealing. Joe FM, Samson Ladi now comes and says Asensu was not stealing at all and that the journalist's work was crass. Listen. Irresponsible journalism can be costly. Some media ran to press minutes after the Asen Central MP alleged that the Minister for Housing, Francis Asen Subwachi, and former Chief Justice, Kwesi Eninye Boa, had engaged in some corrupt conduct over a bungalow for Justice Samuel Mafosau after his death in August 2021. The indecent haste to give currency to the allegation was as shameful as it was most unprofessional because the allegation was one that was easily verifiable but not verifying put those spreading it and media houses at risk of defamation suits they simply cannot defend. Now even if as later explained by his brother and lawyer Raphael Ejapong who is seeking to wrestle the Bantama constituency from the minister was true that the concern was lack of consent from the judiciary to take over the property that was also very easily verifiable just by a phone call it was the height of reckless journalism to publish such defamatory comments by a man seeking votes for his brother without the basic checks required by the ethics, natural justice, and common sense. I train journalists on these issues, and I know too well that no journalism school teaches this kind that tarnishes the practice generally. I defend journalists, but don't come calling me, not even for the frequent free legal advice when you are induced or decide on your own to be this unprofessional. Apologize now to mitigate what those affected may do. You know, they can sue just anyone, any entity or group of persons spreading the false claims. Joy News Checks brought up this February 2023 agreement between the Judicial Service and the Ministry of Works and Housing. It was an agreement to pull down four of those small houses sitting on large tracts of land into 20 modern houses. The judge's house is one of two allocated by the ministry to the service for superior court judges. Upon completion, that should increase. So, yes, that, that was something. We just cut that short. So, this is Samson Ladi of Joy FM mounting a defense for a government minister, Bantamas Asensu Boachi. So, I'm, so, I'm looking at it in two angles. Now, I've not finished with the parliamentary, the big winners of, of, of Saturday. I'm coming, I'll come back after Asensu. I'll take, I'll take one last big winner from Central Region. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you who it is. A big winner from Central, a very, very big winner. From central region everyone said that he was going to lose uh, but he won i'll come to that in a minute but here's here's a census uh, situation bantama sensu Buache is the minister and he's been accused of corruption when we do these things here and say that this accusation of corruption is is wrong it's crass the work that a journalist did was poor we have been accused of defending government. This is something Ladi in. This is not Paul Adamosh. Now, why is he doing that? He's doing that because the facts are so clear. When you look at the facts and they are clear, and Cecilia Dapa has done nothing wrong, the fact that everybody wants to hang Cecilia Dapa doesn't mean that as a news media, we shouldn't interrogate the facts and be able to say that it looks like she's done something wrong. Everything points to that because of the hula baloo. But here are the facts. He has not done anything wrong. That is a government minister. That means that you are stomach journalist, you are chess journalist, football, all the names they call me over the years. Stomach journalist, da, 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 da. 
Because we are interrogating facts. That's what journalism is about, isn't it? It's about the interrogation of facts so that you can present a view and the view you present must be sustainable intellectually. If it's not sustainable intellectually, it will blow out of the cover. So whatever view you present as a journalist after you have interrogated the facts should be sustainable intellectually. It's backbone. The narrative that you present, the backbone thereof must be intellectual. That's the point. Evidence-based and intellectual. Once you're able to do that, they will not be able to come to say that what you said was wrong or what you said was not well researched. And so they will say when they are frustrated that you are a stomach journalist, which is okay. That's what Asensu did. Listen to some of the language that Asensu used to describe the media. Uh, sorry. Listen to some of the language that Samson Ladi used to describe the media. Listen. It was the height of reckless journalism to publish such defamatory comments by a man seeking votes for his brother without the basic checks required by the ethics, natural justice, and common sense. I train journalists on these issues, and I know too well that no journalism school teaches this kind that tarnishes the practice generally. I defend journalists, but don't come calling me not even for the frequent free legal advice when you are induced or decide on your own to be this unprofessional. Apologize now to mitigate what those affected may do. <laughs> you see, when you're a child of God, you'll be vindicated. This is Samson Ladi you are watching. It's not Paul Adam, what you are watching, oh. I don't have red background. That's for multimedia. My background is blue, and then it's NDC, and it's MPP, and it's very nice and welcoming. And I'm not saying this is not nice and welcoming, please. I'm just talking about mine. I said this is red. Mine is blue. In addition to being blue, it's nice. It's welcoming. You have the legal skill. My spectacles is here beautifully. And then you have a screen that I can write on. It's so nice. Beautiful. Okay, so what you just saw is not Paul Adamochi, it's something like the Ayinini of Joy FM, the home of independent. Oh, they have a beautiful line, I've forgotten. The home of independent, fearless. Yes, I like the fearless part. The home of independent, fearless, something, something journalism. That's something like defending the position of the government minister, Akufuado's minister. Is he wrong? No, he's not wrong. Is he doing journalism? Yes, he's doing journalism. Is it good for him to be critical of other journalists' work? Yes, indeed it is. It is good for him to be critical of other journalists' work. When you take a, a, a ruling from the high court and you take it to the court of appeal and the court of appeal read it and they want to write their judgment, they can be critical of the high court judge. It's always in the law books. They will say that the learned trial judge lost sight of this. The da, da, da. learned trial judge did a bad job. The learned trial judge so and so and so. That is checks and balances. Montesquieu wrote about it in 1778 in a book entitled Esprit Loire. It is checks and balances, but they accuse Paul Adumoche. Samson Ladi is right there doing it as well. He's defending government. Samson Ladi, is he a stomach journalist? No, he's not. Is he a great journalist? Yes, he is. He's defending government. So does he make him stomach journalist? No. Was Asensu right? Yes, Asensu was right. And Asensu won. So I, I, I needed to use this opportunity to sort of look at it. Look at this matter. Look at this event. Look at this conversation that they've been having about the style of journalism, critical of journalists and always defending government position, always defending. I'm coming to Senor Jose on SML. Thank you for reminding me. I'm coming to Senor Jose. Senor Jose is going to be angry with me tonight. Okay, so let's get to the, back to the parliamentary contest. We are done with us as soon as. Thank you, Samson Ladi. So this is Lawrence Ajin Sam. He's the... Um, and this is, I, I believe, his third time trying to run for PC. The chief executive of Ghana Exam, uh, exam Company, and uh, he's, he's in the central region, uh, Hewan Lehman, he, Heman Lower Dentra. And he competed against the deputy minister for, um, deputy minister for uh, labor, Sir Charles Rekubrobe. They call him Papi. He's from St. Augustine's. You know, you know, so the St. Augustine's boy, so he's, he's quite, he's a nice guy. It was looking very difficult whether Ajin Sam was going to win or not. But he's not a regular politician in, in those terms. But this is not his first time as PC. This is, his, this is his first time as attempting to be a PC. And he had lost uh, the, the other occasions. 
And he went in this time, he's chief executive of Ghana Exam, and he won a very, very good victory. So I just some congratulations, congratulations, sir. And so he's going to be the MPP's parliamentary candidate uh, for the area. Okay, 22 minutes past, 10 o'clock now. We are done with the big winners from Saturday. We end on Lawrence Agent Sam. I'll take text messages. When I come back, we are shooting with SML, and then we are heading for Kisi Ajabe, who is lying on the canvas and telling Cecilia Dapa that he didn't find corruption and corruption-related offenses. I'll talk about the lady at GFA who has uh, uh, spoken to somebody about what I said. I'm, I'm not sure whether she's very serious, but I'll talk about it. Uh, so let's take text messages. We begin with Antoinette. Antoinette, what are people saying? Okay, thank you, Paul. Tonight, we'll start with um, Nuhu Bamba. He says, what an excellent submission, Paul. Um, Samuel Ofosuba says, the truth about the matter is, Honorable Kenny Japan's political declining began from the flag bearership and his brother's MPs lost. Okay, Samuel Ofosuba continues to say that... Um, the NPP parliamentary candidate elections held last Saturday demonstrated how seriously they are poised to win the 2024 presidential and parliamentary elections. Their enthusiasm and transparency depict how they pragmatically are buoyant forward to break the eight for the NPP fraternity in the history of the Ghanaian political spectrum. Most of those elected to the parliamentary candidates are young and exuberant to campaign for victory. This shows that Dr. Alhaji Mahmoud Baumia, Walewale Darling Boy, will mount on the presidential seat for 2025 to 2032, inshallah. Okay, um, Nana also says, hi, Paul. Last week, you promised to play Fifi Kote's tape, but you didn't. And you assured us that you would do it tonight. Please, will you play it for us tonight? So we'll ask Paul about that. Um, Graham Nichols has this to say about the office of the OSP. He says, good evening, Paul. My problem is, do we really need four different institutions to fight one menace, which is corruption? I have been struggling to understand the difference between the UECO, the OSP, the GPS, and the SHRAJ in terms of their fight against corruption. All I see is unnecessary interference and duplications of duties. My humble appeal is that three of these institutions should be abolished and the remaining one be strengthened. Thank you. Now, lastly, Amos Nuama Dodi says the NPP must scrap the delegate electoral system. In now just ended parliamentary primaries, each aspirant spent at least 1.8 million Ghana cities on delegates. The breakdown is we have an average of 900 delegates per constituency. The average speculative token paid across the country was 2,000 Ghana cities. When you multiply it, it's about 1.8 million cities. That is more than their salary in four years. Yes, plus their ex gratia. So before you go to worry any MP for development, do the mathematics first and note that if you do not pay the delegates, you will lose automatically. To you, Sarah. Okay, so coming from Sugri Jonas, he says, Good evening, Paul and your lovely team. I bring you greetings from the NPP just ended parliamentary primaries. We may sound disappointed in some areas, but still but we still remain united. We cannot afford to disappoint Ghanaians. Coming from Fatal Ben, he says, Mr. Paul, good evening. I'm your regular listener of your show. I really learned a lot from you. My name is Fatal Ben from Nkoko Zungu. And coming from Baba Chairman, he says, ineptitude is an understatement talking about Kisi Ajabe. Details of whatever investigation the OSP is doing is out in the public domain for malicious intentions. From Baba Chairman again, he says the OSP is a very serious office, but the posturing of Kisi is undermining the office. And lastly from lastly from Baba Chairman Tamale, he says give power to a man and you will know his true attitude and real color. Kisi got all the praises, but power they say corrupt and absolute power corrupt. What do you have for us, Angela? Great. Uh, a friend, Sugri Jonas, says, Good evening, Paul and your lovely team. I bring you greetings from the NPP. Uh, moving on. Uh, uh, Alhaj Yusif says, uh, Did the GFA just issue a statement apologizing to Ghanaians for their poor performance and exit from the ongoing uh, CAF tournament? The NPP president stated that he knows how passionate Ghanaians are about football. I thought... I'll say how passionate the GFA executives are to the development of Ghana football. Until we redefine football and who should, 
have oversight responsibility over the GFA and demystify what they call interference. They'll continue to engage in corruption. Uh, okay, anyway, moving on. Um, we have from Junior Akbar saying, Welcome back. Good evening, Ghana. Congratulations to all the MPs who won. Those who lost should take heart. Better chance next time. Congratulations once again to Honorable Farouk Ali Mahama. The good people of Yanid believe in you and they will continue to believe in you. Uh, we also have from Rebecca D. Lancaster saying, How a Kumsin is a strong, stoic, no nonsense woman. How about all the way? Uh, Dauda Abu Bakar Sadiq says, Good evening, Paul. Congratulations to Dr. KB Mahama and Dr. Gideon Boako. Also, from firstly, Prophet Elisha Nana Osai, uh, he says, Good evening, Apostle Paul. Lawyer Kofi Obriyoboa is a good man and so humble. God bless him. And also, we have from our friend Taufik watching us from Ketakrachi. Greetings to you. He says, Paul, I would like to commend Honorable Asenso and his contender lawyer at Japong for the maturity they've shown on the election day. It's just admirable to see both of them together singing and joking with each other. That was political maturity at its best. Back to you, Paul. Okay, so let's get back on the touch screen and uh, get our stories running. Uh, people tell me they are feeling sleepy. I should hurry up and get to the Tia story and then they want to listen to that one and then go to bed and continue tomorrow. Okay, let's talk about SML now. All right, so we, we stood here the other day and said that the SML contract is a good one and that the allegations that had been made by the fourth estate are hogwash. We found out the fourth estate is fourth estate in keeping with their uh, uh, perceived criminality, forged documents. We put out a video from here and they once or went on Facebook and, and then they responded with some statements, some shippy statements explaining something. They forged that document. We know that if the, the records are there, we can show it. The fourth estate in wanting to show that a contract was signed for a certain number of years perpetrated forgery uh, to all their readers and to all Ghanaians for that matter. They should be charged for forgery by the Office of the Attorney General and indeed the Special Prosecutor, if he is doing his work well, and all the people who look after uh, these things. They forged. The fourth estate actually did forge a statement that we, they put out. We picked their statement and we showed them that you don't need a camera hidden on your body to be a great journalist. We just, we don't, we are not there when they did it. Just by looking at their statement, we observed the forgery. That is the training of a journalist. The meticulous approach with which you look at documents is very, very important for journalism and many other professions as well, law and all of those things. The meticulous nature with which you approach documents. We just looked at their document meticulously. I didn't find it. One of the young people said, ah, boss, look, look, look. Look, I said, what have you found? They said, look, this. they circled this for me. I said, look at these criminals. Forgery. Manasseh Azuri, Suleiman, Brian, Kwame Kaikai. They perpetrated forgery. We put it out here on the television. And people have seen it. And then they had to come and issue a statement and say, it's not a forgery, that's the matter, this and that. Anyway, so what is the basis of this conversation now? Recently, the Ghana Revenue Authority is reporting their highest revenue receivables ever collected in the history of Ghana in 2023. This is the Ghana Revenue Authority's report. Now, if you're a revenue authority and then you are experiencing a revenue that you get from somewhere and then you implement a new system and you are getting more revenue, is that not the only, the only thing you need to know that that system works? This is what is beating my imagination. Somebody should come and tell me that since SML started their work, the revenue that is obtained uh, from, from petroleum has gone down. Is that not, should that not be the point of research for the journalist? Samson Ladi, where are you? Come and help me. Should that not be the point of research for, 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 for Manasseh and his, 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 the criminality that they do at uh, their fourth estate? Is that, not, is that not the point? That's how it starts. This is revenue that you are getting from petroleum companies uh, downstream. This was 200. You bring SML in. SML says that I will charge you 10. SML bring you 500. Ghana Revenue Authority's revenue is rising. What is, the, is, that, is that not the only basis to check whether SML is working or not? Now, you will find out that, interestingly, there's no problem anyone has with SML doing that at the downstream. As soon as the Minister of Finance, Ken Ofoyata, said SML should carry this effort, Ken Ofoyata and the Ghana Revenue Authority felt that because of the gains that the, the, the Ministry and the Revenue agency was getting from SML's work, SML should continue to upstream, to go and check tallow oil, to go and check the upstream companies. And in fact, SML should not even stop there. SML should go to gold 
uh, uh, minerals, extractive industries, all the extractives, petroleum extractives and, and the uh, uh, deposit extractive, the stones, gold and diamonds. SMLs, you check all that. As soon as the Minister of Finance said SMLs should do this, then people started rising up against SML. When SML were commissioned to do downstream, nobody said anything. SML was, was delivering higher numbers and everybody was happy. Minister of Finance says, I need more money. SML, check this one as well. And then everybody rises up. And then there are people who have cooked these things. Now today we're going to begin to talk about them. It is widely reported and alleged. And we don't know whether it's true. That Senor Jose, my friend, please put Senor Jose's photograph. Senor Jose is a very hardworking guy. Very, very hardworking. Senor Jose, of, uh, he's a president of the Petroleum Chamber. I was very surprised when I was told that in an allegation that is alleged that Senor Jose is part of this documentary, this, uh, Senor Jose will not be part of this documentary. This Hogwarts documentary they did, fighting for territory and forging documents after that, Senor Jose is part of it. I don't believe it. That Senor Jose is part of this Manasseh Azuri people trying to undermine the SML work because they want to undermine the government and they want to undermine Kenoforata and they found some friends they have around Kenoforata and in the government. They found some friends in the government who are not happy with SML because they are not part of commissions. Is, is that how we sacrifice Ghana? That somebody is not part of commissions, so he goes to find Manasseh Azuri. Is that what he does? Is that what Manasseh Azuri does? He has no story sitting down waiting for people who are fighting each other. And then they come and give him a story that he will publish this documentary that he did where he's forging documents to show that there's some other Is Senor Jose part of that? I don't believe it, but we're going to investigate it because Ghana belongs to all of us viewers. Ghana belongs to all of us. We are not going to allow people to derail this republic for their private pockets. We are not going to allow it. That people should derail the republic. If Ghana have any authority, the, the worst of the stories, the worst of the stories was that Ami Shaddai may himself be part of the plot. That is shocking. But for intelligence analysts, it may not be shocking. But for me, it's shocking. I don't believe it. That a Reverend Amish Shaddai, the GRA boss himself, is against SML because the people that he himself is collecting the revenue from, they are in bed with him. And they don't like this SML that is going to tell Amish Shaddai how much he should collect from his friends. I don't know whether that's true or not. But this is very, very seriously alleged that Amish Shaddai. So when Amish Shaddai had this clash with some George in parliament, some of the people were happy. That yes, he has to go. He's been there that long and this is what he's doing. Some judge raised issues about Amish Shaddai's age. If you saw the video on CTTV, he raised the issue about Amish Shaddai's age and said that Amish Shaddai should go. He's been sitting there. I am not happy with this information. And I sincerely hope that it's not true. That these two people, Senor Jose and Mr. Amish Shaddai, are behind the documentary that was orchestrated through Manasseh Azuri and Suleiman Brahma. Now, Suleiman Brahma, is that what he does? He talks to businessmen and they give him a brief. I don't even believe it. Do they talk to businessmen and they give them a brief? That Senor Jose is behind it and Amish Shaddai, the, the one who is supposed to look after the Amish Shaddai could be behind the SML issue. I don't know. But this is the allegation we are investigating. And we are going to investigate it to the bottom and bring you the facts. Because this, this republic must survive. Ministry of Finance says, I am getting more money because of SML's work. Manasseh Azuri and his people should come and show us that SML, Ministry of Finance, is getting less money because of SML. All these things they talk about, somebody else could have done it. Somebody was doing it. Are the figures not there? When the somebody, MPA said they can do it, MPA was doing it, the figures are there. SML is doing it, the figures are there. Which figure is bigger? Which is giving Ghana government more money? We will always support something that is giving Ghana government more money. And the Ghanaians who think that their pocket is more important than the rest of us, everybody likes money. I do. But those who think that that ambition is more important than the republic. This is why media platforms have been created. The media plurality. That is why Edmund Beck calls the media the fourth estate. After the first, the executive, the second, the legislature, and the third, the judiciary. Edmund Beck said, yonder is the fourth estate in the top of the press gallery of the British Parliament as Westminster. That's how the fourth estate name came. Edmund Beck was speaking. He said, yonder. So he pointed to the gallery and said, yonder is the fourth estate. And they are the most important of all the estates. That's why the fourth estate is there. So that people will not hide. Oh, no, certainly not them. Please. Please. Please take it off. Come back to where you were. <laughs> so that people will not... Ah, okay, I touched it. Sorry. So that people will not hide behind some of these things and perpetrate these things and then we can't mention their names. We will mention their names as an allegation for now. But as we are getting close because... There's monitoring going on. People's 
issues are being monitored. People's interactions are being monitored. And this is what, this is what we are hearing. Senor Jose, I sincerely hope that it's not true. I don't believe it. That he's behind this SML thing. Hmm. Anyway, people are texting me. Charlie, it's okay, it's okay. Well, I want to hear what happened in call. Let me read one. Let me, let me reply, let me reply him. He says, it's okay, we want to hear. Okay, please keep watching and send us a text. And uh, when you send the text, mention your name. And then we'll read it. Okay. Yes, I'm done with this one. But we are still keeping an eye on SML. Where we are officially is that President Akufuado has asked KPMG to do an audit of the work that SML is doing. So KPMG is going to answer those questions. Before SML was revenue at 0, 9, 10, 50, what is it? After SML, what is revenue? Did that what SML is getting? Did that also the taxes that SML is paying GRE? And show us whether SML is good or bad. As soon as they say SML should go and vet petroleum, petroleum people are unhappy. Because now they have to pay the right taxes to GRE. As soon as they say they should go and vet mining, mining minerals commission is unhappy. And we have seen documents that petroleum commissions, I don't know about SML. As if it's a gang up of something against a certain situation because everybody's own is inside. Everybody's own is inside. Where is Ghana's own? Everybody's own is inside. Where is Ghana's own? The 30 million people who are not inside the 12. Where is their own? Is that how we want to run the country? America is not run like that, but America has billionaires. Ghana can create billionaires without that. Everybody's own is inside. So everybody says SML is bad. The 12 people, 16, their own is inside. The 30 Ghanaians, where is their own? 30 million Ghanaians, where is their own? That is why I support President Akufuado. He says KPMG should bring it to him for him to convince himself that this is where we are or this is where we are not. We sincerely believe, based on what we have seen on SML, that KPMG will come out with a successful verdict. And then by that time, we would have zeroed in on the people who supported this Manasseh type of work. Has Manasseh even done any proper work before? Look, look at this. Every time he does something, he, his things we've forgotten. He came to say that VRA has given contract to Zoom Lion. VRA said they haven't given me contract to Zoom Lion. He thinks the story is dead. This is disgraceful journalism. They, they, then they, they hide and then they bring another one. Then they dodge and they bring, they're always dodging between trees and bringing another story, another story, another story. I don't know that they also sit down and get paid by people to, to do their stuff. I don't know that. I don't believe it. But from what's happening, people are beginning to talk like that. People are beginning to talk like that. That is Manasseh people. They are just sitting down. They just we create themselves as platform. Two businessmen are fighting. They call them. They pay them some money. And then I don't believe it. But this is how it's beginning to look like. Especially when you see them go to the extent of forging documents to justify their story on SML. They are forging. What are people saying? And this one, uh, after that, we take a break. And then our story on Kisia Jabin is ready. Two minutes. Junior has for Paul. He says, Dear Paul Adomotri, you are a very solid guy. Please investigate this case and get to the bottom of it because some of us are keenly monitoring. Now, Garba Abdullahi Akonsi is still hung up on the parliamentary primaries. He said, Good evening, Paul. Asenso Bwachi's win in Bantama is a clear message to Mr. Kennedy Japan to let sleeping dogs lie for the unity of the NPP party. Fighting everyone will not help the NPP party's unity going into the 2024 elections. Alhaji Dr. Mahmoud Debaumia is the man of the moment, and everyone should try to come to terms with that. Baba Chairman Tamali lastly says that the GFA knows next to nothing about how passionate Ghanaians are when it comes to football and that the government must dissolve the GFA and damn the consequences. Sarah. Okay, from Spices, he says, Good job, Dan Paul. I'm really satisfied with the outcome of the primaries. And coming from Wilberforce, he says, I just love his delivery as always. And then lastly from Francis, he says, good evening, Mr. Paul. Thanks for the good work you are doing. I'm watching live from Tema West. What do you have for us, Angelo? Okay, so uh, from the breaker we played earlier, uh, we have Floyd say, Kwabna Japan, please come into football administration. And we also have from um, uh, Adam Kojo saying, good evening, Paul, please. I think you should respect the views of Ghanaians. Most Ghanaians want the SML contract reviewed and audited. How long since this news broke? Why hasn't GRA or SML published the data to justify their work? And it is a shame that the GRA wrote to the president asking for SML works to continue without any convincing data to back their requests. 
Thanks. Uh, from Kamal Dean Tripoli, he says, why do some few journalists like any name to certain journalists and co feel like they are more intelligent than the 30 million Guineans? And uh, now on earlier topics, we have Abdul Zati from Bogataga saying, excellent presentation, Paul. I always say this and will continue to say that. Yes, you may not like Paul or his way of doing things or even being biased, but you cannot counter facts or that he's saying. Doing this for almost 24 years is not just an overnight thing, but you have to build it for yourself. Von D. Jr. says, uh, Pod Motri, you're a solid guy. Please investigate this case and get to the bottom of it. Some of us are monitoring. And lastly, from Safia New Adam, he says, watching live from Pusiga. Uh, Ken, Ajapong, you lost. Your brother lost. Now your baby mama lost. What do you do now? Back to you, Paul. <coughs> So Kisi Ajabin thinks that he will ignore our RTI request for his purchase of bulletproof cars for 36 million, uh, whose by today's rate is 60 million cities. He thinks that he will ignore it. He's a joker. Please tell him he's a big joker, yeah? He's a joker. Because the laws of Ghana are bigger than me. The laws of Ghana are bigger than him. We are coming after him on the RTI. If he's not careful, he'll be paying said charges and he'll be found for causing financial loss to the state. To quickly answer those questions and write it back to us. When his people, those his appendages, they send RTI requests to places, he follows up. He has received an RTI request and pretending that he doesn't, he hasn't seen it. They've not even acknowledged receipt of it. He hasn't read the RTI law. He doesn't know that there are steps to take. We are going to take those steps against him and he'll be in trouble. The madman. Okay, no, no, he's not a madman. <laughs> All right. So this is the cartoon that we put out earlier today. If you can put it on the TV uh, directly for them to see, people should read. Yes. So Cecilia Dapa says. So all the cameras and drones you brought to my house was for nothing? Shame on you. And then Kisi Ajabin lying on the canvas and smiling broadly says, As for bribery and corruption offenses, dear, I didn't find, oh, but money laundering, I don't know. That is Kisi Ajabin lying there and telling us. Viewers, it's 15 minutes on top of the hour 11. Let me make this very quickly. And can you please put Kisi Ajabin's photograph there? Let me explain why this is a, this is a problem. So, two, three days ago, or Monday or so, we heard that Kisi Ajabe has withdrawn from some Cecilia Dapa matter and, and says that he has, uh, the thing is money laundering and therefore is to go to Yoko. Whether he even has power to recommend to another state agency, I'm not so sure. Whether he has forgotten that the matter was referred to him by the president. Uh, was it referred to him by the president? I don't even remember. I'm not even sure. So, this is what happened. You, Kisi Ajabe, you heard that Ghanaian Chronicle has published a story on Cecilia Dapa. You know that the story was being, uh, the matter is being prosecuted by the police. You are aware of the position of the Minister of Interior and the position of the Attorney General. You knew that there are ways in which you can call for this matter and find out the details. He was clearly aware. Because of his pension for glass and excessive publicity, he carried drones and cameras and went to Cecilia Dapa's house in the full glare of everything. So that every single lawyer in Ghana felt that Kisi Ajabe had breached the rule of innocence until proven guilty. Every lawyer or the sort in Ghana was clear in their mind that by his conduct in going to his ladder past house the way he did, lawyer Kisi Ajabe had breached the rules. And for a special prosecutor, you ought not to be seen to breaching those rules. Martin Amidu, the former special prosecutor, spent ink on these matters and online time to publish articles about this. This is what Kisi Ajabe did. And then when we mounted pressure on him and told him how crass that was and how ignorant that was, he put up a story that viewers we've all forgotten. But he thinks Ghani, he can take Ghanaian journalists for granted. We, he won't take us for granted. When we gave him that pressure, do you remember viewers? If you Google it, it will come. He said, Jabe said he's found somebody who is cutting dollars somewhere, 40 million. He was a liar. Where is the story? Where is the story? Because we were mounting pressure on him and his excessiveness and his Poor conduct, his very, very distasteful public conduct of his work. Kisi Ajabe, his public conduct of his work is distasteful because we were pointing fingers at that and he found himself under pressure. He did what they always do, hoodwinking. Every day, they are hoodwinking. That's what they do. He came suddenly, called some Joe FM and other people and said, I have found a, a, a somebody who is cutting fake dollars in Ghana. It was untrue. Why did I touch the thing and then Anas Arabi out then emerges? 
the two of them, they are together every day. That's what they do. That's how they, that's how they work. Viewers, journalists, call Kisia Gabe's office tomorrow and say, where is the status of that investigation? Let him produce it. In fact, we can do another RTI. He should produce the status of that investigation because we are sure that it's not there. It doesn't exist. He was just doing, that is why he has employed so many, if you look at his employment list, publicity people are more than lawyers. Because this is, he is coming to deceive. John 10.10 10 in the Bible, for the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy, but I have come to give you eternal life. The thief, the Bible says, he comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. Add an analysis photograph. Let me read the scripture again. For the thief in John 10.10, 10, the John 10.10, 10, I'm quoting the Bible. The thief, he comes to do three things. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he did. He went to Cecilia Dapas' house and did what he did. When pressure was mounted on him, he manufactures a story that he is on cash of arms. Somebody is cutting dollars somewhere. He has caught the person. Now, after all the theatricals, and this is the story, Cecilia Dapa says, this guy is messing up. I need lawyers. Call some Okujeto, goes to Okujeto's law firm, highest lawyers. Cecilia Dapa is very lucky to have hired very good lawyers, excellent lawyers. They understand procedure. They are, they are procedural lawyers. They are solid. They understand it. They are barristers, proper ones. They go to court. And then they file against Kisha Jabeda. You cannot see Sila Dapai's money without any basis. You can't. Kisha Jabeda doesn't show up in court. The court is on virtual. We're all watching here the first day of trial. He's in China. He's in America. He's in somewhere doing his things. Nothing but something. So the court says, no, you can't seize the money. The, the lawyers are right. You can't seize the money. So he calls Sila Dapai to his office in this dramatic matter. says, here are your documents and the property that we seized. The other part stands up. He says, I have rearrested you. Bring it back. From, from, I don't even know what the word to describe it. This is what he does. And then the judge is concerned. Ah, what are you doing? Are you violating the court order? This single process, this single misbehavior of Kisia Jabin, occasion meetings at the judicial council and everywhere he was invited. Other people were invited to come. Hey, what are you doing? What, are you, what is going on with you? Then he goes to hold a press conference and says, judges are after me. And uh, 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 maybe someone may call something he was saying. Something here. This, oh, that's what the, he was drumming. He was hoodwinking, uh, pity partying. He's always throwing that. That's what they all are. They're always throwing pity party like an ass. You go to Germany, they say, Where do you get money for? And say, You are doing video. Video and likes and takes an ass. That's what they told German children. Because everybody's wondering about where does an ass get their money from? He, he gets it from a hole. That hole has smoke in it. He said, Jabin came to throw a pity party to journalists. The judges are doing this and that and that. I'm building the story. All about Cecilia Dapai's matter. Okay. Time has elapsed. He said, Jabin now files his application to court. That this is my application against Cecilia Dapa. The reason why I'm seizing the money. Last week, court has been looking for him. Uh, last week, he shows up in court. Now, viewers, listen to this. You go to Siladapa's house in the full glare of satellite television. You attend Siladapa's residence in the full glare of satellite television. Come to court. You are standing in court. Defend the position and defend the applications you file. You know what he did? He walks to the judge and says, You have gone to embarrass somebody using state resources. Use uh, uh, drones and satellite TV to show the world that she, she has stolen. You would lie to the world that you spent five hours searching the house. That's how I went there. That's house. Within how, how long will you? Within 20 minutes, you finish. You said five hours. That's what he told the judge. Now come to court. Stand in court and move the application so that the court will agree with you that you can see certain things. You want to do it in private. When you were disgracing her, you did it in public. When it's time to demonstrate the reason why you should have, the reason why you disgrace her to defend your position, to defend your legal position and express your legal knowledge, you want to hide in the judge's chamber. You don't want the journalist to hear what you are saying. 
Because he has nothing to say. He has absolutely nothing to say. He has poor preparation. Absolutely poor preparation. Why? They say that sometimes... Oh, sorry, my microphone is off. Uh, should I just fix it? Uh, yeah, come and do it for me. Come and do it for me. Let the sound come and do it. Uh, sorry, viewers. Sorry, viewers. Sorry, viewers. We'll finish this now. Can, can they hear? Yeah. All right. Can you hear? Time out. Keep your... All right. Thank you, viewers. When it's time for you to demonstrate your legal knowledge... Before the bench, because well, the same when people are uh -huh, the same when people are given to debauchery, they usually have very poor preparation for their work. I don't know whether it's true. I don't. I'm not talking about Kisera. I'm not referring to him. But they said that when people are given to debauchery, they have very poor preparation for their work. When you are given to debauchery, come prepare for your work. So he shows this kind of porous preparation to file the application or to to defend the application. He comes to court and he tells the judge that. He wants to speak in chambers. The judge is concerned that, ah, you want to speak in chambers for what? You have gone to see somebody's money. You, we told you you can't seize it. You, you turn around and seize it again. Okay, now come and tell us why you are doing that. You want to go and do that in chambers. What kind of lawyer is that? That's why I stood here that day and said, he said, I've been on the basis of this. He said, disgrace. Total disgrace. He was talking about, yeah, today he spoke at CDD conference, talking about we want to scrap the officer. We don't want to scrap the officer of the special prosecutor. We want to diminish this attitude. This kind of attitude is what we want to diminish in the office of the special prosecutor. That's what we want to diminish. We don't want to remove the office. Remove the office for what? We are talking about you, Kisi Ajabeu. It is about you. It's not about the office of the special prosecutor. It's about you and your conduct. Your conduct in the office. That's what we are talking about. Violating legal principles and breaching them anyhow for a criminal law expert is totally disgraceful. So Kisi Ajabin told the judge that I want to speak in chambers. The judge says I cannot grant this. Just tell the court what you have to say. What is speaking in chambers? Back and forth, back and forth. The judge says, okay, come to chambers. He comes to chambers. What is the argument? He has nothing to say. He says, okay, my lord, I'm withdrawing the application. The judge says if you are withdrawing the application, you're entitled to do so. But then you have to return her money to her. Yes, he returns her money to her. Comes out and tells the press that. I've withdrawn the application because it's money laundering. It's money laundering means that he investigated corruption and corruption-related offenses. Where is the result of that investigation? What is the verdict on that one? Because as for that one, he said that he has authority to do so. He's lucky the journalists were busy and they didn't ask him that question. Because you are a special prosecutor, you do not have mandate to investigate money laundering. Yes, we know that. But you do have a mandate conferred on you by law to investigate corruption and corruption-related offenses. Did you investigate Cecilia Dapa for corruption and corruption-related offenses? What was the outcome of that investigation? Did you have time to conduct the investigation? Did you move away from your pleasures to take time to do the work and come out with a, a, an, investigation, an investigative report on that? You can't come and tell the general public who are paying you money. Whose money you take to go and buy bulletproof cars, 50, 60 million CDs, you spend it on cars. You can't do that. Parliament has just approved 140 million for the Office of the Special Prosecutor. You can't do that and come and not do the work and just get away with it. You were supposed to you you send taxpayers petrol money to Siliada Pass House, taxpayers internet to publish your drone videos of her so that you will become a hero, so that we will know that you are the one who owns glass. So that you become a hero, come to court and talk about it. You want to say it in camera. You cannot say it in camera. You say you have withdrawn your application. Withdraw your application. You go and tell the journalist that you have withdrawn the application and it's money laundering. How long does it take you to know that the price matter is money laundering? In any case, your act does not allow you to look at money laundering. Your act said look at corruption and corruption related offenses. You said you have seized the other person's money. He said, I mean, said so. Journalist, please ask him. He said that he said so, that he has seized the other person's money on the basis of corruption and corruption-related offenses. What happened to that particular investigation? He said that he should come and tell us what happened to that particular investigation. It's not every journalist you see you can hoodwink. It's not every. It's not every journalist you can hoodwink who do not understand what you are doing. You have a deficit of explanation to render. You have been investigating the other for corruption and corruption-related offenses. Where is the report? 
We will demand it of you because you cannot go be sitting in China, take Ghana police to South Africa, go and be in Pretoria, conduct your affairs and say that you are working for Office of Special Prosecutor for the Republic of Ghana. And when you have investigated a matter, you do not have a report to publish. You only come and tell us that the matter is something that is outside the purview of your law. Money laundering is outside the purview of your act. Your act has no power over money laundering. So what were you saying? It's like the IGP comes and says that I've been to the Ghana-Togo border. I did not see any stealing by the people. What I saw is aggression from the Togolese armed forces. But that one is not me, it's the army. We already know that it's the army. It's the army. So he said, I've been telling us that it is money laundering, therefore it goes to Yoko. It is a repetition of what, the, 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 it's a repetition of the limitation of his act. He is just so damn lucky that no journalist asked him that question. Now, what are you telling us? Money laundering is not in your law, so money laundering cannot be part of it. So when you were looking at Siladapa, you couldn't have been looking at money laundering because the law does not permit you to do so. You couldn't have been looking at money laundering. He said, Jabie, when you were looking at Sisi Adapa's brief, you couldn't have been looking for money laundering because money laundering is outside the law. You were supposed to look at corruption and corruption-related offenses. You yourself said so. Where is the report? Where is it? Where is the report on the corruption and corruption-related offenses? Not that he didn't do the work. He did the work. He didn't find it. And he is so pumped up with ego. He is not able to come and say, taxpayer, I use your money to find corruption and corruption related, but I didn't find it. He's unable to do so. He's so popped up to say that this is it. He didn't find it. He didn't find it. For all the jumping about he went to do in the past residence in Abelimpe, jumping about with drone and making himself out as if he's a superstar of a Black Stars player. All that he did. He came to the table. He didn't find it. And instead of admitting it that he didn't find so that the young people will learn from him, he goes back to the old books, hoodwink and deceive everybody. Just hoodwink and lie and deceive everybody. This is how Kisia Jabin works. If they say we want Office of Special Prosecutor, and this is a special prosecutor that we want, God will help us. God will forgive us and help us. Let's take the text messages and then uh, we'll see what we do next. We have two or three items. Let's take the text messages first and we'll take the break. Okay, so here's what Yapa Pivi says. He says, Paul, I think Kisi Javin is really living this soft life because he's really enjoying the tax payers' money. Mohammed Yusufa says, Mr. Paul, who recommended Kisi to President Nanado for the OSP position, by the way? Ben Ayiti says, Paul, thumbs up, thumbs up for what I call education, but can you please find some time and investigate the 8.5 million USD budget for the Black Stars for the AFCON? And lastly, Junior Akbar watching us from Tamale says, my group and I are going to launch Operation Special Prosecutor Must Resign because the nation is suffering in the hands of the so-called OSP that if we do not voice it out for the president to set this man, I think it will bring down the country so every media should help us to propagate it so that he would go and leave the nation to move forward because he has nothing to offer the good people of Ghana. Sarah. Okay, so coming from Isa, he says, Good evening, Paul. That special prosecutor has the right to direct or refer a case to any agency after nothing has, after nothing is found in their end. Mr. Sule from Karaga constituency, thanks. And also coming from Junior Agba, he says, I'm going to launch Operation OSP must go because he has nothing to offer the people of this nation. I think President Nana Ekufado have already regretted for appointing his for appointing this arrogant person as our special prosecutor. He's an enemy to the, to the nation. And lastly, from Joseph, he says, Mr. Paul, more fire. What do you have for us, Angela? Okay, uh, we have Kweku uh, Bekwa saying, Martin Kwebu hailed him, uh, presumably referring to our special prosecutor. Uh, we have Spices Nana got, uh, Nana saying, uh, good job done, Paul. I'm really satisfied with the outcome of the primaries. Uh, Alhaj Bob City says, Paul, assalamu alaikum. I greet you on the studio. My first day of watching you guys in the new year, send my regards to Ekwa Vincent Asifwa Esquire for his victory. 
Prince Scott McTominay of Poku says, no wonder we Good Evening Ghana won show of the year. Uh, it's current affairs show of the year, and the award is right there on the table. We also have from our friend Derek Ofer Jr. saying, don't be fooled. Paul Adam Autry has no equal. He does this thing with sheer grace. I can only imagine the targets on his back, and yet at every attempt, the vindication comes to him, top guy. And lastly, from Safianu Adam watching us from Gariki Pusiga, he says, Good evening, Paul. Uh, Manasa and his cohorts at Fourth Estate are classified. That's a very he used a very strong word. I will not uh, mention it. He says who only engage in crash journalism and blackmail uh, during the droughts of proper journalists, with the exception of few. How frotting morsel of an effort from so, so, this message is too harsh. Back to you, Paul. Paul. Ah, we are back here. <laughs> okay, let's take let's take the last commercial break in. Uh, let's see what we can do with that. Break time. Thank you. Welcome back. And uh, permit us to just take a last bite of the uh, Good Evening Ghana tonight. <laughs> okay. Uh, Al-Hassan Bello, Happy New Year. How are you? How is the Legon Center for International Affairs? Uh, should, is it the first time we are experiencing people indicating that they are leaving or that they've left ECOWAS? I think this is the first time we've seen such a fissure in ECOWAS. But then what this does is consolidate the divide between the countries under military rule and those under civilian administration. And then interestingly, we are now seeing the first practical step taken by these three countries under the Alliance of the Sahel States, which they announced somewhere in September last year. So, but then, when you compare the three countries under military rule, and then um, Guinea, which is under military rule, you could see a different approach. Mama Di Dumbuya in his own side has focused more on administration and then taking legitimacy for his regime, because somewhere last week, he was in Rwanda, he visited Paul Kagame. But then we could also understand his approach because he does not have internal security problem at hand. But he's a military ruler too. He's also a military ruler. Okay. But these three countries have, what do you call it, insecurity. So Guinea is not asking to leave ECOWAS? No, Guinea has not left ECOWAS, but it has been suspended. Okay, so it's on suspension. But uh, uh, Mali, Burkina, and Niger, they, they were indicating they were, to leave ECOWAS. Yeah, they've indicated to leave ECOWAS. But they, have also, they are also under suspension, aren't they? Yeah, they were under suspension, and then there was this attempt to negotiate with them. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, what do you call it? They felt that by suspending them itself, ECOWAS has failed to really respond to their needs. But let's also bear in mind that the coup itself has popular support. Mm -hmm. When this decision was pronounced, was announced rather. Which country are you referring to? The three countries. All of them. All yeah. the coups are popular support. Popular yeah. support. And then when this um, announcement was made, it was, there were celebrations, I think, in Niger. But then what is the reason behind the popularity of the coup? It's because, one, they felt that those countries have been under overbearing French influence. And so when the coup happened, they took anti-French stance, certain as anti-French rhetoric. But they felt the coup has become a tool that is being used by France to protect its interests, and that is where the anti Equa sentiment emerged from. Now it has now taken a new turn where Equa is now divided. But then the question now is what is the way forward? Because whether we like it or not, these three countries are landlocked. Mm -hmm. But then, unlike Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali seem to, be, to have consolidated their powers in the house. But recently, there was, I think, not less than three coup attempts that have been foiled in Burkina Faso. We really oh. can't say if it's just mere ploy by the regime to gain popularity or not. But it seems the recent one was more of a serious event. Because post that incident, we had, what do you call it, Wagner. Mm -hmm. And Russia deployed troops, you know, when Prigozhin was killed. Russia, report emerged of Russia forming a new unit, which they call, Afri I think, is the African Corps, African Brigade, but something... Uh, under the, under the, the direct control of Vladimir Putin now, that Prigozhin is dead? Well, we can't say if it's under the red control of Putin. But Wagner itself has always been, have this, always enjoyed this shady, what do you call it, image. We don't know to what extent is the state in control of it. But what we can see for sure is that it's an arm of Russian foreign What are these policy. photographs you're seeing? 
Yeah, this is a deployment, the recent one in of Wagner. Yeah, of Wagner in Burkina Faso. Wow. So and then to what extent has this was 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 there a coordination between Russia and this announcement? Because immediately we saw this deployment a few days before the, what, the announcement. But then it tells you to a certain extent that ECOWAS has really, really boxed itself in a tight corner, having threatened to use force in Niger, and then allowing the, the three countries to call, up it, to call it bluff mm -hmm. and fail to take a decisive action. ECOWAS have appeared to have become a toothless dog. And so this is another way of upping the ante. But prior to that, there was also a release by ECOWAS that explained they were supposed to be in Niger yeah, within the week, last week, for further negotiation with the military regime in Niger. Mm -hmm. But then they said that there was um, some technical issue with the chartered plane, so the flight could not move. Then subsequently, we had this announcement. So what's the future? Should, should they be taking seriously, these three countries? Should they be taking seriously? Well, first of all, the, their legitimacy have not been recognized by ECOWAS. Likewise, it has not been recognized by world powers to say. But then they've been, what do you call it? You know, we are facing the global alignment, the world is becoming more multipolar. So there are regional powers that are rising and going in influence. So for whatever, what do you call it, whatever they lose within the structure of ECOWAS, mm -hmm. will they have an alternative or not? Once they have an alternative, and that can entrench their regime, then I think this division would continue. What, what do, you, do you think they have an alternative? You have to answer the question. Will you answer it in the affirmative? Do they have an alternative? Well, they seem to have one if the French have been kicked out and Russians have become the new, what do you call, their new protectors. seem to have one. And across board, in every instance... Can the, can the Russians give them what the French would have given them? Well, I think for them, it's not about Russia giving them what the French has given them. But the fact that Russia is there, it sends the image of that independence so there's always been the anti-French sentiment, particularly in Burkina Faso. It runs deep because of the legacy of Thomas Sankara. And across the region, over the years, French policy have not really been favorable. For certain there's always been this argument about what are they really paying France for in terms of the benefit of colonial rule. So until there's a rearrangement, I think we need the days of using the stick has been, like it has elapsed. We can't use the stick anymore. We failed, the courts failed to take a decision at the point. They kept arguing with yeah, that. but for the countries going forward, because economic sustainability then becomes a real denominator in these matters. Whether you can sustain yourself economically, whether your people are not going to die of hunger, they're not going to die of disease. These are the fundamental issues. That's why I'm asking you that: Can the Russians are they able to? Do they have the footprint in the uh, the sub region? Uh, do they have the international connections? Russia are they a pariah state? If they are a pariah state, they can't help you that much. Do they have the international connections? To support an African country in all of these health delivery systems, development agenda, infrastructure development, education, they able to do that. Well, globally, Russia seems to be isolated. But uh, for whatever isolation they face, they've been able to align their policy with China. So for whatever they cannot present economically in terms of finance, China is here to foot the bill. And that makes it very easy for them to survive. We've seen um, what you call Venezuela, which is just in US backyard itself. Mm -hmm have been survived despite the difficulty of the situation. Moreover, the socioeconomic uh, situation or the problem would be a second, what you call it, consideration. The most important thing at hand today in these three countries is the insecurity and the going jihad insurgency. To what extent they, have they been able to fight it? It's quite difficult to measure. So who are their enemies and opponents in, the, in this fight of trying to create stability? Is it their own people? Is it uh, the re renegade groups that have left the country, then the former look, president. Then we have to look at these three countries in their peculiarity. Mm -hmm. okay. Burkina Faso, in their case, they overthrew what they call it, an entrenched regime of Thomas um, uh, Compaore, Blaise Compaore. Mm -hmm. But then the army itself is not united, so beside the jihadists they are facing, there's a deep division within the Burkina Faso military itself. You know, when Kompare was in power, there's a particular thing he did was that the Russian Security Regiment, the RSF, and then, um, what do you call it, the Gendarme, were his darling boys. Mm -hmm. Because they were seen to be, what do you call it, tools for regime survival. Mm -hmm. And then the main military itself was kept at, at, at a distance. 
because they were seen to have influence of Thomas and Karen to a certain extent, they were threat to the regime. So whatever you are seeing today, the, the, what do you call it, the prevalence of coup attempt in Burkina Faso tells you that this division has not really been addressed. So that the enemies of the, of the regime, those who are threatening the regime, are people from within. In Burkina Faso, it's from internal Burkina, within, within the okay. because In Mali? In Mali, the problem in Mali now is that recently the Malian government opted out of the 2015 peace agreement. That was supposed to reconcile the military government and the, what do you call it, the Tuareg rebels in the north. But what they didn't really, perhaps they should have considered is the interest of Algeria in that situation. Because the chaos itself was born as a result of the collapse of Gaddafi's regime in Libya, post-NATO intervention, and the weapons trickling down. And we saw how it engulfed mm -hmm. the region. But then Islamists took advantage of it. But historically, Libya and Algeria always fought for influence within, what do you call it? Within, lower Sahel. Yeah, within Lower Sahel. We, we talk about the famous Libyan-Chadian war, mm -hmm. the Toyota war. But then with the fall of Gaddafi regime, Algeria remains the next party. But what is the interest of these two countries in, this, in Mali, for example? For Libya, it was an attempt to portray Gaddafi as this omnipotent regional power. For Algeria, it's more about security concern. Because the bulk of the Islamist militants in Mali are of Lib or Algerian origin. The famous uh, Mukhtar, Mukhtar Ben Mukhtar is an Algerian. So for them, the stability of Mali is akin to the security of Algeria because, of the, because they share a long border. But now, having abrogated this agreement, if Algeria decides to also pursue a more securitized foreign policy and decide to back the rebels, because there's cultural similarities between the Arabs in northern Mali and, what do you call it, the Algerian, Algerian regime, against the Islamists and, by extension, the Malian state, then the Mali government will kind of have difficulty in dealing with that situation because once they have access to weapons, then they will become a, big, a bigger threat. Is Bola Sinibu not showing up as ECOWAS president the way we have seen ECOWAS presidents do? Well, his rhetoric when he became ECOWAS chairman was firm, that he wasn't going to tolerate a coup d'etat. But then he also failed to understand the dynamics within ECOWAS. There's what I call the DECA, what do you call it, um, Abidjan, Accra, Axis. Those are the four important capitals in West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, and then Ivory Coast. So if you look at the, prior to the, the discussion of invading, what do you call it? Invading Niger. A conference was brought, one conference was brought to Accra. was initially postponed. Mm -hmm. It was Nigeria's attempt to get Ghana in. Because if, had they gone to the point where Nigeria, um, Burkina Faso, and no, no, um, Ivory Coast, and then Senegal, have they invaded without Ghana? In terms of decision making, they will have, out, what, outnumbered Nigeria in shaping the post, what do you call it, mm -hmm. post intervention phase. But then Ghana needs, Nigeria needs Ghana as a buffer. And Ghana refusing to commit troops actually thwarted that decision. Mm -hmm. So, but the Tinubu has a bigger challenge. Now, having given a very bellicose rhetoric, now you have a challenge that you've, you've not been able to address. And even internally, he himself, looking at the outcome of the election itself, to a certain extent within the East, he does not enjoy support. So, there's this problem now, Nigerians feel like. He has really lost what he called the argument. You know, there are those who believe that one of his reasons for that offensive approach was that he compared his time to Obasanjo. No one Obasanjo, Obasanjo was in office. Nigeria was everywhere across West Africa mm -hmm. to douse down the fire. So now, having been a person that has challenged Obasanjo throughout his life, if that is one of his motivation, then mm -hmm. he has lost out of that competition of being a regional power. Because under him, we could say that Nigeria has receded. Wow. Hmm. I'll leave it here. I'll leave it here, Bello. Uh, do you have concluding remarks, uh, uh, social media? One each, maybe? Uh, you don't? Okay, uh, Antoine is going to give us one. Well, Ali Omar, um, he says, Assalamu alaikum. So, where have you been, Al Haji Bello? Because I have missed you for a very long time. We miss your analysis on here. That's it for me. Okay, we've got also from El Desaki, watching us from Kumasi, saying, uh, Good evening. If Honorable Howard Kumsum is described by lawyer Paul Adam Watre as brutal, then lawyer Paul Adam Watre is a double brutal journalist. May he live long to continue to impart, impart deep knowledge. Anyway, back to you. That's why we live with viewers. Uh, congratulations to the Bafana Bafana. They've made it to the quarterfinals of the uh, African Cup of Nations played, being played in. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire, my friends in Soweto will be very excited 
uh, that the Bafana Bafana have made it. Bafana Bafana, I have, I've stopped watching them. They don't play well anymore since Dr. Kumalu. <laughs> but here they are again. Uh, they are in the next stage and Ghana is not there. So who are we supporting? Are we supporting Cote d'Ivoire? Are we supporting Nigeria? Well, my money goes to the Super Eagles of Nigeria. Hopefully, Osime can start scoring. And then we have a great tournament uh, elsewhere. Arsenal won by two goals to one against Nottingham Forest uh, in the Premier League game that was played uh, in England tonight. Tomorrow, Chelsea lock horns with Liverpool at Anfield. That promises to be a good game. Thanks for watching. Good night.